Yeah, well, what I'm out to is move. Put the mini on the other side. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> it's a bit hard to see. Avatar's not rendered properly for some reason. That's really weird. No. Huge pleasure to introduce Denise Wood to everyone who's here today. Denise has actually been with us since last Wednesday, since she's been running a, a really intensive workshop on virtual worlds and giving us um, some practical experience in this. Um, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about Denise before she starts her presentation. She's a senior lecturer and researcher in the School of Communication, International Studies and Languages at the University of South Australia, which is similar to our UNISA, but pronounced differently, UNISA, and it has a small i. Um, her research focuses on the use of accessible ICTs to increase social participation as well as the pedagogical benefits of social media, which we are increasingly interested in at UWC. So some of you may be aware, but the origins of uh, 3D virtual worlds such as Second Life can be in fact traced back to Neil Stevenson. Some of you, if you are sci-fi fans, will recognize the name, uh, who wrote uh, extensively uh, in the field of talking about this thing he referred to as the metaverse, which is essentially a 3D virtual world where users represented by their avatars or their persona meet and interact just like they do in the physical world. So that more than a decade later, um, his uh, popular science fiction novel, Snow Crash, which uh, goes back way back to 1992, was realized in the form of Second Life, which is perhaps one of the most well-known of the public virtual worlds, uh, which was uh, established in um, 2003, gained perhaps most of its uh, notoriety in 2007 and 2008, but even today, 2012, continues to be a very popular virtual world for education. So you'll see I've listed a couple here, Second Life and Active Worlds. Um, the work that we're doing in the socially disadvantaged schools is in using an open sim, which is an open source version, essentially, of Second Life. And I'll talk more about why we've used open source uh, later on in the presentation. But essentially, when we talk about a virtual world, we're talking about a combination of the use of the web, massively multiplayer role-playing games, and avatar worlds. It's a combination, really, of all of those three things. However, they are distinguishable from games as such, because unlike MMORPGs, uh, the massively multiplayer role-play games, 3D virtual worlds really don't have fixed rules or fixed goals. Um, they really are a space that enables us to do really whatever we like. And that is why we find virtual worlds across so many disciplinary areas. They're used for uh, so many different ways, not just in education. Of course, it's quite possible for us to create a game within a virtual world that does have fixed rules and goals. But virtual worlds in themselves are really tabula rasa. They're essentially a virtual space ready to be populated and developed in any way we like. 
the 3D virtual world's second life began just that way. And in fact, the whole metaverse of uh, second life is now created by its users, also known as its residents. In the early days, we used to communicate essentially in virtual worlds using text chat and instant messaging, but increasingly voices gained uh, uh, popularity. And of course, we can also support video streaming and animations in these environments. Uh, so many schools and universities have university uh, have islands, uh, university islands. Harvard University does a lot of law simulations in Second Life. There are something like 44 universities in Australia, and that's about all the universities there are in Australia who have a presence of one kind or another in a virtual world. So that just gives you a sense of the growth in popularity of these virtual worlds. There are businesses operating out of, out of uh, virtual worlds such as Second Life. Virtual conferences are, are very popular in virtual worlds. They're also a wonderful source of community information and you'll find that there are many special support groups that have been set up in virtual worlds like Second Life. They're also popular places for social activities, social networking and for providing support for, for example, disability groups. There are many disability support groups in Second Life. So what is it that makes these virtual worlds popular? Well, one of the things is that you can choose to represent yourself via your avatar any way you like. Now, that has both positive and negative aspects, perhaps. But some of the positive aspects are certainly for some of marginalised groups. It's enabled people, for example, with disabilities to explore with different identity. It's also enabled people to get to know each other without some of the barriers that sometimes occur when we have preconceived notions when we first meet a person. But I guess where they're most important is that you can do things in virtual worlds that are hard or impossible to achieve. And I should have quote marks around real life because virtual spaces are very much real places. They are driven by real people. They are very much real interactions. Um, Tom Ballstorff, who's an anthropologist and wrote the first ethnography of Second Life, argued very strongly that virtual worlds like Second Life are genuine spaces in which to conduct research. <coughs> he never questioned the identity of the people with whom he interacted and uh, observed as an anthropologist because his, in his view the virtual space in which they were occupying was a community in its own right and therefore a valid place to undertake research. I similarly have undertaken ethnographic research with uh, groups of people who identify as having a disability in their actual or physical life. So one of the things that's made them very popular in education is that we can do role play simulations, we can do laboratory experiments, it's much better to blow up the virtual laboratory than the physical laboratory. We found them particularly useful for um, developing communication skills amongst professionals uh, because it provides the opportunity to people to assume different kinds of identities as part of the role play simulation and that becomes a much more natural relationship in the virtual space. Okay. There are some issues which I'm going to um, come back to in a moment, but what I would like to do, first of all, is just share a video, uh, which is one I've put together, which shows a little bit of a showcase of different kinds of simulations and activities in virtual worlds, and these have been drawn from Second Life and from several other virtual worlds that are very popular today. So I'm just not sure how that will play on a large screen, but we'll see how it goes. 3D virtual worlds are acknowledged as ideal vehicles for e-learning, as they are immersive spaces that allow for 3D modelling, simulations, role play, creativity and active involvement by learners. A recent Horizon report suggests that 3D virtual worlds are firmly established as valuable learning spaces that blur the boundary between the virtual and the real. Communication in 3D virtual worlds takes place via the learner's avatar persona. The learner signs up to the virtual world, chooses an avatar representation of themselves, and then visits places in the virtual world, 
or engages in interactive activities and communicates with other students and teachers using either chat, which can be text or voice, or instant messages. The University of South Australia established a 3D virtual world in Second Life in 2008, and since that time has established similar virtual worlds on a public server called Reaction Grid, as well as a virtual world hosted on the university's own server that can only be accessed by university students and staff. These virtual worlds have been used for a variety of teaching and learning activities, including health simulations, role plays, creative writing, collaborative games design, service learning, and career counselling. The University of New England is using virtual worlds for distance education of pre-service teachers. One of its virtual regions is called Astralis. Students who don't meet on campus can come to this shared virtual space for meetings, tutorials, guest presentations, and to interact with puzzles and other activities in the simulated classroom. One of the features of virtual worlds is that they encourage constructivist learning activities. Virtual worlds can be created by the learner using built-in tools and primitive objects. There are places in virtual worlds where students can learn how to build an experiment with these building blocks. Students learn a variety of skills when building their own creations in virtual worlds, using primitive objects such as cubes, cones, cylinders, spheres and pyramids. They can manipulate varying colours, textures, dimension, volume and also simple programming skills to bring their creations to life. Such activities can be undertaken in teams to facilitate teamwork, collaboration and communication skills. Virtual worlds also enable students to visit simulated places. They could be replications of places that actually exist or even fantasy worlds designed to stimulate the student's creative imagination. Many virtual worlds provide students with the opportunity to visit places in worlds through a virtual experience such as the Virtual Africa Tour, where the student can see Africa through a virtual journey in a hot air balloon. Students can also learn about history by being placed in a historical era so they feel as if they're actually visiting the places as they learn about the history. They can even meet and talk and ask questions of historical figures such as world leaders, scientists, mathematicians, or artists. One of the very powerful aspects of virtual worlds is that they enable the learner to control the environment and experience the impact that their decisions will have within the safety of a simulated world. For example, students can learn about environmental conservation by creating a sustainable farm from previously unpopulated landscapes, such as this prairie simulation. Here, we see the student building a wind farm to generate power for the farm. Another example of this kind of interactive simulation is this coal mine. Here, students can drive mining vehicles. They can also learn about occupational health and safety. And in doing so, they also learn about the impact on the landscape through mining activities. Similarly, science simulations are ideally suited to virtual worlds because students can carry out experiments safely. They can also undertake explorations to learn about astronomy, physics or even genetics by being immersed in the simulation. For example, rather than reading about the Big Bang Theory, students can be part of the experience to better understand the principles. Similarly, they could witness the effect of a chain reaction. Students can even explore genetic code by manipulating variables and seeing the outcome from their actions. What better way to learn about anatomy than to walk through giant working models of the body, such as the ear, the brain or even the heart. 
Roleplay simulations are very popular in virtual worlds. Role plays have been found to be valuable learning tools for the health sciences in higher education as they provide the opportunity for students across a range of disciplinary areas to develop professional competence in simulated healthcare environments, such as a pharmacy, chiropractic clinic, a radiography department, or even a lactation clinic. In this example, midwifery students can learn about natural birthing techniques through a simulated birthplace. Students learn about hospital practices in simulated clinics and hospitals, such as this London Polyclinic simulation. And the Anne Myers Medical Centre, where nursing training is conducted. Students can also develop negotiation skills through international relations simulations, <coughs> such as this UN simulated environment. They can also develop their future employment skills through entrepreneur training and career simulations, enabling students to learn about different career options and role play interviews with potential employers. The potential for engaging learners in interactive, creative, problem-solving activities in 3D virtual worlds is limited only by our imaginations. Thus, collaboration with educators and evaluating learner and teacher experiences are fundamental to the strategy required to ensure we provide students with the most powerful, engaging and stimulating learning opportunities these 3D virtual worlds offer. This brief walkthrough of virtual world learning experiences has attempted to demonstrate the potential that these environments provide for accommodating diverse learner needs in either monograde or multigrade classroom situations at all levels of the curriculum. Such 3D virtual worlds afford unique opportunities to link students with other students within schools, across schools and even across international borders and they provide an approach that supports a range of curriculum objectives, including literacy, numeracy, health, social justice, environmental sustainability, entrepreneurship, and digital media competence, or... I'm just gonna stop there because we'll run out of time. So that's just given you a little bit of an overview. There are some issues that I think we need to be cognizant of as we start to move towards using virtual worlds. And this will bring us back to the national project that I led to provide some context for how we've addressed some of these issues. Some of the things are obviously these are very visual environments and thus are much more challenging for students with disabilities. There is a risk certainly when we're using public servers like Second Life um, that uh, students may be subject to harassment because environments like Second Life are all things to all people, they're not just educational environments. Obviously as we start to look at virtual worlds that are public server based and internet based, then access to technology both in terms of bandwidth but also in terms of the graphics capabilities of computers is another factor that we do need to consider. Um, one of the challenges that we always face whenever we go to demonstrate virtual worlds at any university, including this one, is that generally the ports that are used to access virtual worlds are blocked by universities for security reasons. Again, there are ways around that, but there are some of the little obstacles that we have to address as we start to use virtual worlds in education. Um, there is quite a learning curve associated with the whole process of signing up, orientation, but also then interacting in the virtual world. And if you're using a public server, there are some financial issues to consider, which we'll come back to. So I want to move on to provide a bit more context about the national project that I led, which was funded, as Viv mentioned, by the Australian Learning and Teaching Council. That was funded in 2008 and was completed last year. There were several aspects to the project. One was to investigate some of the challenges for students with disabilities. Another was to explore possible solutions for those students, to develop an open source accessible 3D virtual learning platform 
to create teaching tools, but I guess most important for many of you here was also to develop guidelines for teaching in 3D virtual worlds and design, designing technologies that are accessible to a diverse student audience. So the first aspect involved developing an accessible open source viewer. That viewer uh, does have menus that are much more accessible for students with disabilities. It can be operated without reliance on a mouse. It has audio notification of all things that are happening on the screen. So if a sound is playing, it will give you a text indication of that. Uh, it also converts um, all text to speech and it provides also an indication of uh, what avatars are in the immediate vicinity, lets you know what avatars are around by name. We also created a web-based system that meant that students who could not access the virtual world could still participate in text chat sessions that were conducted in the world, but via a website. It could also run off a mobile device um, the text that was displayed on the website and on a mobile device was accessible for students who needed screen readers. Um, and it also allowed them to listen to any audio streaming that was coming outside of the virtual world. Um, so what I'll step you through is, um, I'll talk very briefly about the virtual world environment itself. We'll talk about the case studies from higher ed that we undertook as part of the project. We'll talk about some of the guidelines that we developed through the project. I'll also talk a little bit about the work, that how we've adapted that work then to South African schools. And then I'll end up on an inspirational video um, that will show you another way in which virtual worlds are used outside of education. Um, this is an interface of the web version of our 3D virtual world and you can see I don't know whether this is going to work for me. Up in the corner here is the screen shot taken from the PowerPoint slide that was being shown in the virtual world. Over there we see streaming um, images coming from the virtual world. So if the student couldn't attend the virtual world, they could still on the website see screen images coming streaming from the virtual world. Down here you'll see a record of all of the text chat that's occurring in the virtual world that the students could also interact with via the website um, and there was also streaming audio as part of that. Uh, and this is what students in the virtual world would see. There's the screen slideshow presentation. Just down here, uh, it's hard to read because it's a, a blown up screenshot, but that green lighting, uh, green writing is in fact the text from that screen being projected in text. Because that's a graphic image, we also had it translated into text and read aloud for students who had visual impairments. And as I said, we'd adapted it so it was also accessible via a mobile device. For those techies amongst you, that's in fact what the solution looked like. So essentially you've got the virtual world over there uh, with students interacting in the virtual world, sending data out to a database, a separate server, which is then being streamed via the website to students who were unable to get into the virtual world, either because they didn't have the bandwidth, they didn't have the graphics capabilities, or because of their particular disabilities making it difficult for them. All right, so that was a bit about the uh, technology that underpinned our project. I want to move more now on to the guidelines and, and what underpinned the development of the guidelines. One of the first things that we did was uh, investigate the affordances of different kinds of e-learning technologies. By affordance, I'm referring here to Norman's um, definition, which is the perceived as well as the actual properties of any kind of technology. In this case, we're talking about e-learning technologies that determine how the technology may be used effectively, in this case, for online learning and teaching. If we look at Web 2.0 technologies, which, and when we talk about those, we're talking about wikis and blogs, photo and video sharing sites, podcasting, bookmarking, social networking, such as Facebook, etc. Um, the term Web 2 was uh, dubbed by Tim O'Reilly in 2005, 
who argued that Web 2.0 is blurring the boundaries between people and the machine as communication and our social networks are increasingly computer mediated. In fact, Axel Bruns, who's an Australian researcher, proposed a new term which he referred to as Generation C because of the capabilities required to interact with Web 2. And you'll see they're all C words, being creative, being collaborative, being critical thinkers, um, combining different kinds of media together to create mashups, as we call them, and communication skills, so the big C words. As we move to virtual worlds, I think there are many similarities between virtual worlds and Web 2.0 technologies. If you go back to the C words, they are, of course, very creative environments. They are also collaborative environments. They're constructivist environments. You can create, you might have seen in that little video clip, a very quick demo of how one can create objects and constructions in the virtual world. So they are all those things. But I guess there's a few things that are quite distinctively different about 3D virtual worlds as opposed to uh, Web 2 technologies such as Facebook, for example, or YouTube. The first is that there is a sense of space. Obviously, we're moving on a two-dimensional plane. We're looking at a flat screen, but we're giving, getting a sense of being in a 3D virtual space. Interestingly, that is one of the reasons that people who are blind tell me they like to be in Second Life. People always puzzle at that because they say, well, how? It's a 3D visual environment. How could you possibly get a sense of space? But of course, we've also got 3D surround sound. And people with uh, visual disabilities rely very heavily on spatial sound. So if you've ever been into Second Life, you will have noticed that as the avatar moves towards you, the voice gets louder. As they move away, it gets more distant. As it moves around, you can track where the avatar is. So we can make extremely rich sensory environments, not just relying on the visuals, but relying also on the audio effects there as well. Uh, opportunities for experiential learning that are impossible or difficult. We mentioned that in the video, reinforce some of those skills. Um, intrinsic motivation, Csikszentmihalyi talks about being in the flow. That is, we are so engrossed in the particular activity that we are almost oblivious to other things that are happening. And that certainly happens in a 3D virtual space, more so, I think, than just a flat website. Um, Anyone that has done any has spent any considerable time in the virtual world will tell you when they go to a website, they immediately try to hold the alt key and scroll in and out and around because you get, get so used to being in that spatial environment and being in the flow of the activities. So it, these environments are very intrinsically motivating. Uh, learners are engaged because they are engaged in the activity in which they're interacting with other students, um, rather than just because there's an extrinsic reward or because they're being graded on the activity itself. Transfer of knowledge, I think this is an area rich for research and I think uh, uh, there are many opportunities for undertaking research in virtual worlds if that's an area in which you've got interest. Certainly how well the knowledge and skills that we um, rehearse in the virtual world transfer to real life situations I, I think is an area that is under-researched at this point and certainly one that's um, very right. Um, I've, uh, as I mentioned, undertaken ethnographic research in the 3D virtual world Second Life. I undertook that ethnographic research with people who identify as people with disabilities. I'm just going to go to, if I can find where my Second Life icon is, back there. This is my avatar, known as Den Lee Wobbit in Second Life. Just don't ask. <laughs> But anyone who knows me as Den Lee Wobbit know that that's my researcher identity. The way in which we undertook our research, as you can see, I'm actually on our, one of our SIMs, our regions, UniSA SIM. Um, we put these posters out. You can see the posters there. And we distributed those over regions or islands, as they're also known, throughout Second Life the sims that are known to be frequented by people with disabilities. So places like Virtual Ability Incorporated, Wheelie Sim and so on, which have strong communities and networks of people with disabilities. So I placed all these note cards around these sims and then waited for people to either send, click on that note card, get my um, instant message details or my email and then contact me to say they would like to participate in the research. I then conducted semi-structured interviews 
uh, by the person who I was interviewing, it was their choice how we undertook the interview. Some of them chose to use voice. Uh, some of them found that voice was much easier because of their disability. They found typing was very difficult. Most chose to use text, um, either because they did not want to identify or they had a speech impairment or a range of reasons like that. It's not uncommon for people in virtual worlds to prefer to use text so that it doesn't reveal too much of their identity. Of course, as a researcher, if they chose to use text chat, it was wonderful because it's much easier to cut, copy and paste the text chat than it is to transcribe the audio, as any of you researchers will, will relate to. Um, and so that's essentially how we carried out the research, very much along the lines of an anthropologist. And by that I mean I lived and among the community, literally morning, noon and night for weeks and weeks and weeks. Any anthropologist will tell you the only way to do true ethnography is to actually live among the people. In the virtual world, you live on their island. You, you lease an apartment, a virtual apartment, and you reside there and you go to the events that they invite you to. You will not um, really be able to experience the, the lived experience of the people with whom you're um, researching unless you spend that kind of time because they have to build up an empathy with you, a sense of trust, just as with any anthropology work that might be done. So they're very much, very much like just going to another community. In fact, Tom Volstorff, when he, if you read his um, virtual ethnography, he opens um, with, with a quote which was taken directly um, from anthropology where it's describing arriving on a strange place in the world that you've never been to and feeling totally isolated and out of your depth because it's a new community, you can't speak the language, you don't know about the mores, you don't know how to interact. And it's only over time that you become part of that community. And it's very much the same in a virtual community. You'll often hear people say, look, I, went to, I joined Second Life, I went into Second Life, there was nothing there, it was boring, there was no one around and I got out again. Well, actually, if you went to any strange country and you just arrived and you did not know anyone, you didn't go out of your way to meet people, you didn't join social clubs, you didn't go to social activities, you'd very quickly find yourself feeling very isolated. So it's very much the same in virtual worlds. One of the uh, things I learned from our research in the virtual world is it's really important to remember where you deposit the note cards, these posters, because for months after I thought I'd wound up the research, I was getting IMs from people who'd found my poster still on a sim somewhere. So that's just a tip for anyone that wants to do uh, ethnography in the virtual world. The other kind of research that you can um, do effectively in, um, in virtual worlds is autoethnography. Um, uh, we've just been talking, Viv and I have been talking about the possibilities of, of uh, looking at identity and diversity because there's no better way and in fact I started to do some autoethnographic research, I just didn't have the time to continue with it. And, and that arose because one of the people I interviewed who had a disability was in a wheelchair in her actual life and in the virtual world, she chose to represent herself in a wheelchair in the virtual world. I asked whether she'd ever experienced, because she represented herself as a person in a wheelchair in the virtual, whether she'd ever experienced discrimination or any kind of harassment that she might have experienced in the, in the actual world. And she challenged me. She said, put yourself in a virtual wheelchair and go around Second Life and then you can answer the question yourself. And in fact, that's exactly what I did do. And I'm not going to give you the answer because there's a challenge to you as well. Very easy to adopt an uh, avatar, get a wheelchair, and go visit. Spend some time, and you will be able to answer the question. OK, um, all right, so collaboration communication. Now, I said that I was going to uh, share another really exciting, uh, interesting video, and I, I want to share that because the other aspect I've talked about teaching and learning, I've talked about ethnographic research and the fact that they're wonderful environments for research, but the other area is for dissemination of information, such as at conferences. And I want to share this particular video. The audio is not particularly good, but it's worth watching and bearing with the audio, I think. Oh, I've lost him. Where's he gone? Let me just make that a bit larger for you. And you may say, what is 
This got to do with Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Well, you're about to find out. Thank you for your very kind words of uh, introduction and your, and your very warm welcome. <coughs> Obviously, I am not uh, as young as I look. <laughs> A few years ago, they, they named the school after me in, in a small village in the Netherlands. Now that's not the important part of the story. <coughs> the school was celebrating its 400th anniversary. And my, my wife and I went to this village to share in the celebrations. And when we arrived, a little girl came up to me and said, when you here when the school started? <laughs> I, I, I thought I was, I was decrepit, but I didn't, I didn't expect that it was quite so obvious. <laughs> oh, by the way, they, they have since renamed the school. <laughs> <laughs> I think they thought better of it. Yeah. <clears throat> it's so wonderful to be amongst you, especially you young ones. Have you noticed? So what did you notice? Okay. That was a live award presentation being beam simul simulcast into four different virtual worlds. I don't know whether you noticed, but there was a children's virtual world there and the interaction among the children. Um, very rich opportunities for collaboration between the real world and the virtual world and across virtual worlds, across global boundaries. Very rich. You can see the discussion there. So I don't want to spend too much time, but you can find this on YouTube if you're really interested in watching the whole thing. I mean, he's a, a very eloquent speaker and it's worth watching the whole thing. But I think that gives you a sense of the diversity in which these virtual worlds provide very rich opportunities for our students to engage in teaching and learning, for us to undertake research, for us to use it as a vehicle for reaching many, many communities. And you might say, why simulcast like that? Well, because you reach certain kinds of communities in these virtual worlds that you would not reach any other way, because we tend to find different kinds of communities, not only in, different, in virtual worlds, but in different virtual worlds, as you might have got a sense. There was Second Life, there was Teen Second Life, there was Wiley and so forth, and I think uh, Active Worlds was there as well. Um, and many conferences, worldwide conferences for academics, and there's one coming up right now in Second Life, Virtual World's Best Education Practice, where academics come together. It's much cheaper than getting an airfare and accommodation, I could, believe me. So what is it about the virtual space that's quite different from Web 2.0? Well, it's the sense of presence. There is the spatial dimension to it, and it's the sense of presence. Because people do identify with their avatar very strongly. Um, and for that reason, there's a lot of social capital wound up in one's avatar. In fact, IBM is undertaking research into how they, you can actually take your avatar identity across virtual worlds. And they're doing that because they recognize the social capital that belongs to your avatar. There was a case, a uh, legal case a couple of years ago, where a, um, a very angry um, spouse killed off her husband's avatar and it is possible to kill an avatar, yes it is, and, um, and it, and it went, ended up in court because it, uh, not over murder, although there were, you can imagine the media headlines, <laughs> murder of avatar. You know? So she wasn't convicted of murder, but she was uh, convicted of, uh, of theft of property because there is both, um, both uh, social capital as well as financial capital that are all wound up in your avatar. I mean, I would be quite devastated if Denley Wobbit got killed off because uh, I, I have a, a many, many people all over the world uh, uh, relate very strongly to that avatar who is known as, as, as someone who is doing research in the virtual world. And so we do relate very strongly to our avatar identities. Okay, so what are some of the benefits? And um, uh, I'm drawing also here 
uh, on the work of a researcher. I'm going to share her framework in just a moment. Uh, but certainly we've talked about being able to practice skills in the virtual environment um, in, a safe, in a safe way and that might be difficult in a face-to-face -face context. Of course, flexible learning. We're all interested in ways of making our learning experiences more flexible to the learner. Uh, it does allow us to provide the opportunity for students who are off campus to interact with students on campus and with each other. I ran several courses in Second Life when we first started out on this project where I would have students in the lecture theatre, I would have Second Life on one screen and the PowerPoint on the other screen, the students would be home, those who couldn't make it, and it was a variety of reasons, sometimes it was students who were working and the, uh, the, their boss wouldn't allow them to sort of leave the environment but would allow them to spend an hour of their lunch break attending a virtual class. I had students who were living in remote locations who could not have completed the course because it was traditionally a face-to-face -face course except through this medium. I had students who were ill and who couldn't come onto campus but they could, they could still work from home. And so it was a very immersive experience because I was able to teleport visiting lecturers from anywhere in the world to our virtual space, as you saw, our island. And in fact, the students who were remote and participating through the virtual world actually felt privileged over the students in the classroom because they were in the shared space on the virtual world with this eminent, you know, res the re eminent researcher from somewhere else in the world. So. Um, there are some sense, there is a great sense of presence in these virtual worlds that you do not get just through a discussion forum. Um, one of the interesting things was when I offered students a break, a coffee break in the classroom, and I said, um, and the, all the students at home giggled and they said, but I'm just sitting here eating ice cream, why do I need a break? You know, so they, they were clearly embracing the notion of flexible learning at its, at its uh, greatest, uh, to the greatest extent. Um, opportunity to provide formative feedback. One of the things about running a virtual class is that you can combine the local text chat or voice chat with instant messaging. That meant that I could have a class of students with me in the virtual space who were all interacting together and you can use voice or you can use chat, they could all hear each other. But then if a student seemed to be disengaged, not participating or not getting it, I could send them an instant message personally, just in the other window. Mind you, you want to make sure that you're using the right window when you do this, but uh, you can send them a personalised uh, message. You can also zoom in if they're doing an activity in the virtual world, you can zoom right in and see very close up exactly what they're doing. And you can even have a private voice conversation with them with no one else hearing. So, you know, that personalised learning experience and being able to pace the learning to suit the individual learner's needs is important. I think one of the things about these virtual worlds is it's okay to make mistakes. And you know, students through their learned experience are very, very nervous. Um, my experience has been students in a face-to-face -face context are very nervous about making mistakes. They're also sometimes a bit of a distance. And I, I found this quite fascinating. Um, I used to log into the virtual world and I'd find my students in there on Sunday sitting on the virtual beach having a chat, you know. And I'd come along and sit on a virtual rock with them and one of them said to me one day, oh, this is so cool. I've got my professor sitting right next to me. And I said, but I'm just down the corridor at UniSA. You could... But to him, it was a different level. It was a different sense of interaction. And I guess I can relate to that in a different way in that if I bumped into someone who was a, a world-renowned researcher in Second Life, I wouldn't think twice about asking them to come and run a virtual lecture for me. And yet I probably feel just a little bit nervous about sending them an e a cold email, cold canvassing to say, you know, will you do a guest lecture? But there's something about that shared virtual space where the, the kind of hierarchy doesn't seem to exist. Another example, I had a, a, a visiting lecturer giving a presentation on the beach just as my newbie, and newbie is the term for uh, someone who's very new to a virtual world and still learning the interface controls, and my students were stumbling around trying to learn to walk and, you know, walk straight into this poor visiting lecturer and thrust his avatar into the water. But, you know, there was no sense of that being inappropriate. It was quite obviously, you know, it was a mistake. And yet in the virtual world, if they sort of bumped in or something, there would have been a greater sense of distance in, and a feeling of, in, of being inappropriate behaviour. So there's a lot more permission, I think, to explore and to be a little bit more experimental in these, pa in these places. 
Um, so I think, you know, the whole notion, and, and as I said, I'm, I'm referring a lot to in this, uh, the next couple of slides to Savin Baden, who's done a lot of work in looking at the theoretical underpinning behind the pedagogy of teaching in virtual worlds. So they do offer new opportunities. Uh, she's particularly interested in the new opportunities for the study of socio-political impact of learning in higher education. And she argues that's because spaces like Second Life are universal. They're not bounded by time or geography. Um, and they adopt very distinct learning values that are quite different from other kinds of learning spaces. But she argues that there's been really only a very small amount of research into understanding student learning in these spaces. So here's another challenge to you. It is a rich area for research if you're looking for new opportunities. Um, I would argue that it is a more participative and potentially paradigm-changing environment. It's one that really allows learners to collaboratively construct knowledge together. Referring back to the work of Axel Bruns, who um, really was referring more to Web 2.0 here in this quote, but it applies equally to virtual worlds, and that is it shifts the emphasis on learning from product to process, and I think we'd all recognise the importance and value of that. Um, and of course we are, I mean, some of the market research still predicts that virtual worlds, you know, in another five years will be very common practice in, in businesses. So we are needing to prepare our young graduates to work in with new kinds of emerging digital technologies in a knowledge-based society. One of the interesting things I found after running one of my courses in Second Life and, and it was a student that was quite critical about doing the study in Second Life. She came up to me after a careers night and said an employer had actually offered her a position because he was so impressed with the fact that she also, not only she had the basic professional skills required for the position, but she had an added advantage of also understanding a, a lot more about 3D virtual worlds, which none of the other applicants had been able to talk about. Um, we're not going to have time uh, in the short remaining time we've got available, but what I have um, to go through this theoretical framework of Savin Baden's in detail, but I uh, will be sharing references um, uh, about um, teaching and learning in virtual worlds through Viv, which I'm sure she will distribute widely, and, and uh, Savin Baden's reference here will be available to you. But very briefly, she had looked at six clusters and and um, compared them across what she calls uh, different modes of learning. And she talks about, you'll see the dominant e-space, that, th that term, third column there. Uh, and in the first sort of modes or clusters of learning, she's talking more about our traditional learning management systems, the closed and contained virtual learning environments. And then she starts to move, as we move up these clusters or these modes of learning, into some of the open source virtual learning environments and web 2.0 technologies. And then she moves on to looking at some of the distinctive um, properties or affordances of multi-user virtual environments such as 3D virtual worlds. And you'll notice there she's talking about uh, personal and pedagogic development, learning with and through others, the whole notion of collaboration, multimodal reasoning, um, shared interaction space and of course the whole notion of that spatial environment of the 3D virtual world becomes important and there she's talking about mode three and four learning, um, developing critical thinking skills and so forth. Um, so you can see the different emphasis from achievement of a task in cluster one or mode one learning right through to development of capabilities, constructing an understanding of the content, synthesizing across the boundaries, developing critical thinking, and the, the last level, the mode four and five, which she describes as cluster six, which she describes as very much part of 3D virtual worlds and open source, is interrogation of framework and knowledge. It's a very rich um, theoretical framework and, and the article that sits behind that is equally rich. And I would encourage you, if you're interested in both Web 2.0 technologies and 3D virtual worlds, to take time to read this article, because I think it gives us a very interesting conceptualization of how we can integrate all of these technologies uh, to derive the most out of the respective affordances of those e-learning technologies. Um, very quickly, I'll just run through, we had 10 case studies, five undergraduate courses from our own school in the University of South Australia, mostly in the area of web design, uh, games design, electronic publishing and performing arts. 
We also had two courses which were library and information science courses which came out of um, Edith Cowan University from Western Australia. We also had health sciences simulations, mammography, lactation clinic, chiropractic, which were from the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Victoria, Australia. Um, higher degrees research workshops, which were run by the School of Education at Monash University. Another university um, from Sheffield uh, in the UK ran a module on research methods in education and you should have got a sense of, just as I was describing, the potential for ethnography and autoethnography, how you could equally teach research methodologies through the virtual world. Um, and University of Sheffield also uh, undertook a, uh, a course where they, it was a blended learning approach to inquiry-based learning and information literacy. Okay, very quickly, role play simulations. Um, we certainly found these were very rich, in, uh, virtual worlds were very rich opportunities for role play simulations. Here you're seeing um, a screenshot taken from the mammography simulation uh, conducted at Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. We were asked by them to, uh, to do this case study because they were talking about some of the challenges, some of the kind of ethical challenges that they faced when they were introducing undergraduate first year students uh, that's fine, to um, radiography and particularly mammography where you know it's kind of not very ethical for them to experiment on each other and they weren't quite at the level where they could be let loose in a clinical situation. So they wanted a space where the students could learn to develop professional communication skills. How do you deal with a client who comes in who's really upset because she's found a lump and she's very upset about it and worried? And so what we would have is one student would role play the clinician, the other would role play the uh, patient. They would video, you know, screen capture as streaming video, and then uh, they would ref undertake peer review of the video afterwards. How did they handle the situation? The teacher would equally assess their work from the video. They could use it also for um, reflexive learning so that they could go back and make changes. And then in fact, they, the uh, teachers allowed them to choose the best of their three attempts to hand up for, for final summative assessment. So in that sense, it was very much a formative assessment process as well as a summative assessment. So that was a very rich experience for those students. Here are just some of the positive responses, greater feeling of real time, immersive experience than using a discussion board, a sense of fun and creativity, easier to learn and I think this is really important and retain information because the process of doing. Um, provide an opportunity to gain a greater understanding of the possible responses and experiences of patients before they actually work with patients. You'll notice the less positive responses, less interaction, difficulty of interface, this is a common theme. There is a steep learning curve to using the virtual world for students and teachers alike. One of the, I think, the overarching um, feedback that we got from all case studies was given the difficulty of learning, it's really best to embed this within a suite of courses, perhaps a whole program where students, the investment of time for teachers and for students is worth it, rather than just a one-off course over three years where it's a lot of time for just one course, but it's not if it's going to be regularly used. Uh, and so most of the instructions, you'll see this is a common theme with all of the simulations, all of the um, case studies, Again, this was a, a, a course where students collaboratively develop multi-user role play games. Uh, increased student cooperation, social interaction and learning, greater flexibility, uh, increased ability to think critically, willingness to complete learning activities. Some of the technical challenges were some of the criticisms. The server was not overly stable. It's better now. Um, complexity of the interface, so again, the learning curve was again a common theme there. Um, one of the things that did emerge from that was our decision to also run an intranet to overcome any of the public server stability issues. Um, we also did intermediality and by that you can see there um, we've got a student who's actually on a stage in a conventional play house in a theatre interacting with a dancer in the virtual world who was projected onto a black screen. Um, from the virtual. So we explored 
the notion of the liminal space between the virtual and the real. And one of the reasons we're interested in that is we're interested in the potential of theatre actually going out to communities. For example, we've got one research project where we've been looking at how you can engage communities in the, the, some of the challenges are relating to road crash, the fatalities of road crash, in a way that's not too confronting. So combining the virtual and the real makes it a kind of safer place to still um, mim mimic the sorts of things that occur in a, in a real road crash, but with the, theater, with the uh, audience able to interact with the screen. Very interesting area of experimentation and still not overly well researched. Um, greater willingness to complete learning activities. Learning experiences were active and collaborative. Generation of good interaction, again, mostly around the learning curve and some of the limitations of the, the tools. And again, very similar recommendations. I'm going to summarize all these very quickly. I'm conscious of time here. Uh, information literacy. Um, a pool of interviewees, and again, this applied to also the courses where the students were learning research methods. They've got a wonderful opportunity to interview people who they couldn't interview easily because these were people across all sorts of global boundaries. Um, gave them a place to reflect on the learning experience and, and their skills as interviewers. Again, mainly the technical and learning curve challenges there. Um, experiential learning, I had my students working with disability groups on projects, a uh, very rich learning environment for those students. Uh, ability to combine their IT abilities with artistic passion, learning about the world, uh, including reasons for engagement. Uh, safe environment to guide students through complexities and challenges of dealing with real clients, increased student confidence, greater pride and commitment to achieving excellence and so forth. Again, some of the um, challenges of time differences because these students were working with clients across global boundaries, so the synchronous nature of the communication made that difficult. Um, we've just started exploring the use of virtual worlds as simulations for career planning um, preparing students for interviews with employers. Um, and we've got our final report coming out, and because we've got so little time, uh, I'll just quickly let you know that as part of this study, we did develop guidelines, and those guidelines are for academics, and they, uh, they cover a range of things relating to those technical challenges I talked to you about. So they're guidelines about how to um, minimise some of the, the technical challenges and the learning curve. There are guidelines um, uh, to, uh, on how to provide for students with diverse needs if they're unable to attend on campus. Um, and also accommodating the different kinds of uh, technologies that students may or may not have access to. Um, clarifying learning objectives, uh, intellectual property, we, we have pro pro produced a range of guidelines relating to intellectual property, copyright issues in virtual worlds, um, uh, and code of conduct, uh, how do you deal with student behaviour in virtual worlds. Um, so again, we'll, we'll, they're in the final report that you'll have access to. Advice for researchers around how you go about getting ethics approval, uh, appropriate behaviour as researchers in virtual worlds, and also dealing with the proprietor of the virtual world. Uh, and you know your requirements as ethical professionals to ensure that your participants uh, have, in, have given their informed consent. And then finally, we also have produced a set of guidelines around for administrators um, on how to deal with the technical complexities, managing and supporting virtual worlds on a campus. Again, we don't have time to go through those guidelines in detail because, you know, there's something like 72 guidelines. But I just want to draw your attention to the fact that we have developed guidelines for administrators, researchers and teachers. They will all be in our final report, which is in press right as we speak and will be available to download um, once we've formally got approval for release. And just quickly, um, Viv mentioned we're working in the provinces of Hautang and Limpopo. We basically have developed a virtual world. We haven't got time to go look at it, um, but I've got some screenshots where we've created a virtual Africa which simulates the kind of virtual world that the children are living, the, this, the, the real world the children are living in, but in a virtual context. You'll see they've got a, 
uh, veggie patch there where they can grow vegetables, they plant seeds, they grow the vegetables, they take the vegetables to the market, they engage in entrepreneurial activities, they have to manage a budget, they have to manage their health all through a simulated virtual world. They've even got a little township where they can make virtual goods and sell them. Uh, so behave in a, uh, develop entrepreneurial skills. And these are primary school aged children in both those provinces. Um, and there's a whole range of interactive activities. There's memory boards and flip boards and all sorts of uh, quizzes throughout the virtual world where they score points to uh, help improve their, um, their balance because they've got a virtual banker balance that they're trying to maintain throughout the game. Um, and here's one of the children from one of the schools uh, in Hautang province uh, interacting with the virtual world. That's a three year longitudinal study. We've only just finished creating the virtual world. This trip we are installing it. So if you invite me back in another 12 months or so, I'll be able to give you the first of the uh, results from our follow-up evaluations of whether in fact it has improved learning outcomes, student motivation, attention and retention, especially after three years. Uh, we should have a fairly good set of data across the 10 schools after three years of research. And so I'm sorry it's only a very brief overview of the range of activities that are possible in virtual worlds, but I hope it's given you a, a sense of uh, uh, encouragement to perhaps uh, experiment yourself. Thank you very much. Okay. Denise, thank you so much for giving us this role and tour. <laughs> I must say I feel very privileged that I had the free day on last week. And uh, it really is going to be necessary, I think, to invite you back, sir, because I think you've just sort of raised people's interest, and I'm sure people would be very interested on our campus. There's a huge amount of possibility here. Yeah, so I think so. And I'll leave you on the passing William Gibson's thought that um, the future is already here. It's not evenly distributed, but together we can make it so. <laughs> Thank you very much.